Welcome to The Real Estate Seller on Go Home TV. Today we're going to be talking about generating leads in 2022. Why not 2021? I don't understand. Is it the same thing on it's every exactly year? It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. It doesn't thing. change. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go down a whole list of generating, how to generate leads. Mm -hmm. And you're going to let me know, yes, this is a good idea. No, it's not. Maybe you should think of a different this, career. This is, all, this is the only thing that real estate agents want to know. Okay. Where do they get leads? How do they get their first client? So everybody who goes on social media in any of the groups, mm -hmm. the first thing they ask is, I'm new to this business or I'm slow and I can't get real, not that they're slow mentally, just that they don't have a lot of customers. So they want to know where to get, you, you knew it was coming. I they want to know where to get customers and inventory. leads. Inventory, yeah. Yeah, they want to generate business. Yes. Yeah, that's why they're here. I mean, that's why they care. Okay. You can always get a bartending gig too. That's something. That's a side hustle. Hey, you know what? You can generate leads from that. So, number one, listings that expired within the past six to 24 months. All right, so expired listings. Okay. People think they can just go after expired listings. You, you can't just go after expired listings. And the problem is, you because normally people go after the listings that just expired, and that's a really bad idea because generally the listings that just expired are either gonna get renewed by the current real estate agent or they already have somebody else or it's under contract and the real estate agent just failed to market, you know, pending or sold. So the best idea is to go after an old expired listing. And the reason that you do that, and you want to go after something that expired more than six months ago, but it could have expired even two years ago, okay. just as long as it hasn't sold since the last time it's been listed. Okay. And the reason that you want to do that is because those people had wanted to sell their home. And some, for some reason, they either didn't sell it because it was priced wrong mm -hmm. or they changed their mind, but they really wanted to sell their home at that time. Okay. There's somebody who most likely probably wants to sell their house now if they could get the right price for it. So if the market's gone up and you feel like you can get their house sold for them at the price that they want, then you should go after that. And that, that's why a lot of people look into going after older expired homes. Okay, going down the list, door knocking. Door knocking. Door knocking. Let me ask you something. You're what? sitting home. Yeah. You're just, you're having your coffee, you're hanging out with your family. Somebody knocks Somebody on my door. Somebody knocks on your door and asks you, hey, do you want to sell your house? We don't even get that far. My door stays closed and I'm like, who's at it? Who wants money? What's going on? What are you, paranoid? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay. I don't even answer. Yeah. Like, go amazing. away, nobody's home. <laughs> Nobody home. Um, but so, yeah, no, that's a really bad way to go about it. I think door knocking, I know a lot of people advocate door knocking. I do not advocate door knocking. Okay. I think it's rude. What about divorce leads? I love that. That's great. So you hit up your ex? Is that what's going on? No. You find lawyers. Lawyers, divorce lawyers. Oh, oh, and then they have like a whole list. That they that, have clients. That makes more sense than what's in my head. Because, you know, some people might have like three or four, but that's only three or four leads. Three or four divorces? Yeah. That's three or four husbands. That's not the same thing. I just... But when you, go, when you go after, you can go after divorce leads, you can go after probate leads. Probate leads are leads that um, are houses that are, uh, for, for some reason, are being sold due to some kind of lawsuit um, or lien, foreclosure, but divorce, then, probate. Let me ask you died, something on that. Escrow, something like that. Um, the liens and stuff, that's a totally different subject, but maybe we'll touch on that later. Um, so you, if you were to go to an auction and you were to buy, purchase a property and it has a lien on it, they don't have to tell you that, right? Well, you should do the research yourself. Okay. But generally, when you go to an auction, yeah. you're going because there is a lien on it, and that lien is being foreclosed. And I have to pay that? No. No, no. Oh. If the lien is in what they call first position, okay. it's a first mortgage, you don't have to pay it. It's that auction is paying it off, and all oh. the junior liens are extinguished. Okay. Well, back to generating leads. Yeah. How about social media? Is social media a good way to get leads? Yeah. Maybe. It, it might Maybe. be. Yeah, it might be a good way to get leads. Okay. Yeah, if you're good at it. Ouch. You could suck at it. Okay. And then you would just waste a lot of time and money and not get any leads that way. And, and unfortunately, then you're most, agents, money. most agents, that's what they do. But actually, I had a really cool conversation with an agent yesterday who grew an entire company with like 200 agents, a very successful business on social media because she knew how to use social media. She understood um, the algorithm. She understood how many times a day you have to post. She understood how to use video content. and reels okay. and how to make the right content. And if you do that, yes, you can, you can generate a lot of leads that way. But if you're just going to make a post here and there, it's not, you're not going to get very far. It's not very, okay. Uh, three to seven year old tracked built neighborhoods. I don't know what that is. What is that? Yeah, okay. So what they say is that people keep a house 
for about seven years. That's the average. Oh. They move into the house seven years later, the average person will have sold their home. So if there's a brand new neighborhood and it just gets built out and sold, seven years later, about half of that neighborhood should have turned over. So what they're saying is to prospect in neighborhoods that are three to seven years old, prospect on people who bought the home originally okay. or the first owner, and you're going to pretty much more than likely find a few people who do want to sell their home, so but they haven't sold it yet. Good idea? That's a pretty good idea. Okay. There's another great way to, to generate leads, open listing rentals. Mm. Okay, if you go after open rentals and you list open rentals, you're going to get a ton of leads from that because there's, if I, and I keep saying this, there are more people who need a place to live than there are places to live. So to work in rentals and transfer those people over to buyers is something that New York City agents have been doing for years. They make a fortune doing it because they get paid for the rental and most of those people turn into buyers clients and when they manage that property for the property owner, mm -hmm. when that property owner is ready to buy and sell, they use you as an agent. Okay. So people discount this as like, oh, I don't want to do rentals. I'd rather burn all my skin off with acid than do rentals. It's like, I don't understand that. That makes no sense to Nobody me. Nobody says that. I heard somebody say that no, the other day. No, there's no way. I heard somebody say that the other day. She, well, no, sorry. She said, I'd rather chew my arm off without Novocaine that's... than to do rentals. And I thought, well, that's snotty. But go ahead. <laughs> to find out more information on how to generate leads, just go to the MyStateMLS.com homepage, click on the Go Home TV link, and you will see all of the ways that you need to learn how to grow your business. And here's a couple other great ways to generate leads. First thing is make a relationship with a builder because there's a lot of local builders out there and they, they just build onesie twosie houses, but you can get a lot of business from those builders and you can become their realtor if they're not a realtor themselves. And it's a really great way to get listings. The other way is you can buy leads from an iBuyer like Open Door or Knock or one of these companies. You can just go on their website, sign up with them as uh, one of their preferred realtors, and then you can get a ton of seller leads and, and that will generate a lot of listings for you. What does it mean to be not camera ready? Houses are not camera ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're camera ready. We got ready to this morning. Yeah, but it took us a while. It took, we, well, we put effort into it. You t you right? It took you a while. <laughs> really? Because no. you were in, in there doing the makeup just like me. Okay? <laughs> we got ready. We didn't just come on here without brushing our hair or changing our clothes or putting on our makeup. Mm. Well, the same goes for a house. Mm. I mean, you can't just think you're going to market that house, walk in, Oh, I'm going to take pictures today. The bed's not made. There's dishes in the sink. There's Laundry. crap all over the counter. No, you got to get it ready. So staging? You get yourself ready, get the house ready. Now you might say, well, but it's not my house. Uh -huh. You know, the seller's a slob. What am I going to do? I'm just going to take pictures of the cat litter in the bathtub. No, clean it up yourself. You just want that house to be picture perfect. And the outside curb appeal. Yeah, mow the lawn. Oh. I've seen listings where they have like four photos, four photos of the house, and it drives me insane because I yeah. want to see the rest of the house. Sometimes that's a really good idea. But why do they do that? Yeah. Well, sometimes the seller will not let you clean their house. They won't let you move things, and they won't take things out of the picture that you don't really want to be in the picture, things that could generate um, you know, questions um, that could turn into a fair housing violation. Okay. Sometimes too many pictures of people could um, turn into a fair housing violation. They don't want my family photos? Well, my family's no, nice. espe especially if they're, you know, you know, nudists or something like that. We don't want offensive pictures in the pictures of our homes Mine that we're trying offensive. to sell. I'm just kidding. <gasps> not yours. <laughs> not, not Just mine. somebody else's. <laughs> I've met somebody in a nudist colony once, but that's another story. So, yeah. it's, you ever never notice it's never a good looking person? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Kind of. The good looking people wear clothes. It's true. You know it's true. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so last week, if you were with us, I hope you were with us, we did a... You do realize this is on YouTube. They could just go back and watch last week's episode, right? You should totally do that. And subscribe to our channel. We did the top 10 places that people are moving to in 2022. Well, today we're doing Zillow's hottest markets. And it's not the same as the top 10 people. It places is not the same. Are moving They're to. not moving here. So First of all, different source. Last week's source was who? CE Shop. 
Yes. Yes, last week's that's, source was CE Shop. That's this week's awesome. source, Zillow. Hottest markets, hottest moving to. You know what? You know why they're different? Hottest markets can be different than people moving to? Because it's local, right? Right, yeah. Pe th like this could be a hot market where just like a lot of internal people are moving. But last week's was where people were moving from more away. <laughs> internal. You said internal people, and I thought like an internally I'm moving to St. Thomas. <laughs> Hang on a second. Okay, so hottest markets in 2022. Yeah, moving there too internally. So Tampa's at the top of the list again. Well, they were at the bottom of the list last time, but still within the top 10. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because that was people moving from far away to there. This is just, in general, the market's super, super hot. And it is super, super hot in Tampa. So they all seem the to be reason. cities. Uh, we have yeah. Nashville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. yeah. which was like... Third. I understand that. Okay. Yeah, that's always a hot market. Mm -hmm. San Antonio, Texas. That's always a hot market. That's been a hot market for oh, a while. Oh, so it's all the same. Okay. Charlotte. That's not news. Charlotte's big banking center. A lot of industry there. A lot of jobs. A lot of money. Charlotte's always a hot market. Huge airport. Phoenix, Arizona. Always hot also. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I thought it was just for like years, the last... Phoenix has been hot for years. And a lot of the big like tech companies, the tech, the fintech and the prop tech companies, they start in Phoenix because they have very favorable laws there. So, I mean, that's where... Hang on. Fintech? Fintech, yeah. What is that? Financial technical oh, companies. And see, that prop makes tech more sense. property tech companies. They all start there in Arizona because they have very favorable laws for that. And oh, so I should start a, a business. Market. It's always a really hot market, though. Okay, well, we got a lot of Texas and we got a lot of Florida in here. Orlando. That's not a surprise. Florida and Texas are hot. They get great weather. So it's not really a big surprise. Orlando's lots to do, super fun place to go. Yeah, it's very um, southeast, and then, you know, a couple in Texas. A lot of it's weather related. Do you think? I do. I know, because I spent the first 50 years of my life freezing my butt off, and I'm, I'm, I like to be warm now. I'm tired of being cold. <laughs> I thought she was going to snuggle up. <laughs> <laughs> to see the full list, make sure you go to mystatemls.com. Realogy speaks out against mandatory NAR MLS policies. Yeah. What got, does that I mean? I got a call about that. Well, what does it bunch mean? Of, a bunch of reporters actually, they called me and they wanted my opinion on this. And what's actually happening is there's a lawsuit right now um, where the National Association of Realtors and Realogy and um, some, you know, some of the industry players are being sued by the Department of Justice in a, in a lawsuit an antitrust lawsuit, and it's over some of their policies. And some of the policies that um, are in question are the policies of mandatory compensation on listings. What that means is when I sell a house and I offer a commission to a buyer's agent, it usually just comes out of the deal, but more it's more that it's written that it comes from the seller and that the seller is offering a commission to their agent, and then that agent is splitting that commission with a buyer's agent, and that's how it works right now. Okay. So when you go to an MLS, there's a requirement to put compensation into the MLS. You can't enter a listing, but you can put anything you want in. So it can be, it's a text field. So okay. you, it, could be, it could be as low as a dollar. And so what the guy from Realogy is saying, the, um, the CEO of Realogy, what he said was that, well, since it's a dollar, that's kind of, a, a, that's a policy that really should be changed because if it's a dollar, then why does it have to be there at all? Why can't the MLS have no requirement whatsoever? But that doesn't mean that people still won't co-broker, they won't cooperate. Okay. And I, because cooperation is part of the law anyway, it's part of license law. But compensation is not, shared compensation of the deal is not part of the law, okay. but cooperation is. You know the difference? Not really. No. Cooperation is if you represent a buyer and I represent a seller, I'm going to allow you to have access to the home to show your buyer. Now, how you get compensated, how you get paid is up to you. Sometimes I may pay you a percentage of my commission to help me get the deal sold. Okay. But you may also want to get some compensation from your client. And every deal is different. Everyone structures their deals different. And those are all negotiable. Okay. And that's what keeps the prices low. That's what keeps competition and prices. Um, and, and that's what that's going to obviously put downward pressure on compensation. 
But, I mean, competition is good for the market. So what's the issue here? I don't understand. The issue is yeah. that buyer's agents all over the country are freaking out because they think he's saying that agents shouldn't co-broke anymore, that they shouldn't split the commission anymore. And he's not saying that at all. Oh. Not at all. What he's saying is it just shouldn't be required by the MLS because it's not up to the MLS to say what that compensation is and or should be. Okay. That compensation should always be between the listing agent and their seller. Those are the two people who make the deal, right? right. I'm going to say, how, hey, Mr. Seller, how much do you want to offer in commission to get your house sold? I want to offer this much. Okay, how much of that should go to me and how much of that should go to a, a buyer's agent? Okay, and then they'll, they'll say, oh, well, you know, split it 50-50 or you get more, or you get less or let him get his own fee from his own person. So all of those deals are different. They mm -hmm. should be different. And it's the difference in those deals that make it a free market and give competition to the market and keep or help keep prices low for the consumer, which is good for everybody. But he's not saying... Um, the CEO of Realogy, uh, he's not saying not to co-broke. Oh, what okay. he's saying <clears throat> is, let it be up to the listing agent and the seller. The MLS has no place making a rule like that because it's not up to them. And, and that's what I said to the reporters who called me, is I totally agree that any deal that is made for compensation needs to be made between the seller and their agent and the buyer and their agent. And followed through. Obviously, yeah. you, you, you yes. make sure that you're following to the letter whatever the contract Well, you're supposed says. to be the fiduciary. You're supposed to be the fiduciary to your client. You're supposed to do what they want you to do. You're supposed to work in their best interest, not yours, and not the MLS's best interest either. So what you need to do is do what you promised your client you would do. What's on your listing agreement? And when any, whenever anyone comes to my state MLS and they say to us, oh, we have this kind of dispute, mm -hmm. what's the first thing that they ask me? What are we going to do? I said, well, why are you asking me? What did you tell your seller you would do? Then follow through. Do what you said you were going to do. What does it say on your listing agreement? Oh, it says this. Well, then do that. Why is this an issue? I don't, I don't understand. Don't put the douche in fiduciary. That's right. Real estate in the metaverse is booming. Is it really such a crazy idea? No, it's not a crazy idea at all. Okay. But it's only crazy because people don't understand it. Right. They think, they don't know what it is yet. And it doesn't make sense. So all I want you to do is think back um, to before the internet, which I remember before the internet was a big thing. And I remember some of the ideas that I heard about what the internet was gonna do. I remember thinking that's never gonna happen because I couldn't conceive of it. But now that I saw what the internet did, watching how the metaverse is gonna evolve seems so natural to me now. It just, it just makes sense now. And the reason that it makes sense now is because you have to stop thinking of things standing still. Things don't stand still, technology doesn't stand still. We're not gonna be doing what we're doing right now in 10 years or 15 years with technology, it's going to evolve. It's going to get better. And as it gets better, things are going to change. So is it <sighs> infinitesimal space that you're basically, you're going into this virtual reality world, the metaverse, mm -hmm. right? And is there layers? Am but, I just going anywhere? No, what? no. Just think about it like this. Okay. It's so easy if you think about it like this. Right now, the internet is 2D. It's on a flat screen. Yes. Well, what's the next natural thing to happen? 3D. It, 3D. Yeah. For it to become 3D. How does it become 3D? Sims. Holograms. Holograms are the next thing. Projectors that project up out of your Alexa or your, your Google thing in the middle of your room. There'll be projectors in that. It'll project holograms all around you. And instead of you leaving the house and going to the mall, the mall will be in your kitchen. So it'll be like houses for sale. There'll be, instead of the 360 viewers, you're going to have a whole virtual yeah, house mean, for sale, essentially. Right. We're not jumping into the computer. The computer's jumping into our world. Think about it like that. Right now, you don't see it around you. Right. And in 10 years, you're going to see it around you, and it's going to be projected from somewhere. Okay. And when it is there, it's going to feel like it was always there. It's going to feel natural, and you're just going to, it's just going to become part of your world. Like right now, when you can go on the computer and you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world, and in seconds, they can hear your voice and see your picture. 
Well, 20 years ago, that was unheard of. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I would have said, Mom, I'm going to call talk to somebody in China today, she would go, oh, no, you're not. My phone bill will be huge. <laughs> now it doesn't even cost money. You just go on and, and, and there's free programs and you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world and see their picture live. Yeah. So we have to get out of the mindset that things are going to stand still. The world is not going to stand still. It's going to move forward. How is it going to go, move forward? Where is it going to go to and how is it going to get there? And who are going to be the people carrying it there? And those are our kids. And that's what the metaverse is going to become. Those dating sites are going to just explode. Oh, yeah, I thought about that. I want, left, I, I, left. I, I want to open all kinds of businesses in the metaverse. I really do. I thought of a whole bunch to open. But you, you'd have like a, a hologram boyfriend, so I don't really need to actually find one. I'm just kidding. I'm just, that's not going in there. <laughs> the 10 most expensive Hamptons real estate deals in 2020 of okay. 2021? Oh, yeah, because we closed the year out. That makes sense. Who knew? Yeah. All right, but you know what? The Hamptons is one of the most expensive markets in the country, and the most expensive deals in the most expensive market in the country has to be pretty expensive. Oh, well, that's actually good because our company owns the multiple listing service in the Hamptons and also New York State MLS. So most of those deals were probably on our site, but okay. let's see what you got. Uh, $200 million on a ranch. Uh, whopping six hundred. Whoa, whoa, six hundred and seven million. Way to be a. Listen, Nicole. For a house. For a house. Way to be familiar with the material before the before the filming. If you want to see the rest of the list, go to mystatemls.com. All right, I got a good story for you, Nicole. What's that? I just found out that there's a house for sale on the water that actually was a wedding chapel. It's like a floating wedding chapel. Okay, so you're stuck. It, you're stuck. You're stuck. Yeah, no, here, here's, the, here's the skinny on it. Now, after being listed for as much as $600,000, and it, it costs $1.3 to build this thing, so oh. talk about an over-improvement. Yeah. This former home of a thousand I do's. And one spectacular I don't. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's back on the market for $399,000, and they're throwing in the life jackets. But the question is... What? The question I have for you is... Would you go on that boat, house, chapel, floating thing to get married? Would you do it? No, I have commitment issues. Well, I mean, like, you couldn't say no once you, you got can't out say there. No. You're trapped. I mean, you can jump over. You're marrying the guy if you get out there or you're swimming back. I, I don't like those odds. Yeah, but what I want to know is who spends $1.3 million to build a floating wedding chapel and they can't even sell the thing for $400,000? <laughs> I mean, talk about a waste of money. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you know what? Just go to Vegas. It's a lot cheaper. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah.